Hi, I'm Lynn Lormsby, and I'm representing the Environmental and Water Resources Institute Water Distribution Systems Analysis uh, History Project. And the purpose of this project is to document the history of water distribution systems analysis. An important part of this project is a series of interviews with engineers, modelers, researchers, and practitioners who have made significant contributions in the field of water resources, and in particular, water distribution systems analysis. Our interview today is with Dr. Angus Simpson. Angus is a professor of, at the University of Adelaide in Australia, and he's been very active in the field of water distribution systems analysis for over the, the last, uh, say, 40 years. Uh, and Angus has helped pioneer research in, in several areas, in particular transient analysis, looking at leak detection methods, uh, and also in the application of optimization methods and evolutionary computation methods in the design and analysis operation of water distribution systems. This interview is actually being conducted on May 17th, 2015 in Austin, Texas. And uh, the first question I have, uh, Angus, is I, I note in looking at your resume, you had uh, a lot of in industrial experience really uh, kind of before you went back to get your master's and then afterwards before you went on to get your doctorate. Uh, and I'm just curious uh, to what degree that practical experience impacted your interest in water distribution analysis or even you know the desire to go on for advanced degrees? Well I guess the um, things in terms of my practical experience that got me involved in water distribution systems were were um, firstly I I started out as a hydrologist. I was in my undergraduate degree, I studied at um, Monash University and I was really keen on hydrology. So I went into a, a water resources planning and investigation section at the Melbourne and Metropolitan Board of Works. And during that time I worked in two areas. I worked in developing hydrolog or hydraulic models of simulating water or water resource systems to look at the next expansion for Melbourne. And then in the last two years of that role, I worked as a construction engineer. I then applied to go to Colorado State and took a fair few hydrology courses, especially um, from Yevchevich and Hall in particular. And um, but near the end I started taking hydraulics courses and I, I found hydraulics quite fascinating. And um, a, a guy called Vic Kelzer taught a hydropower course and he encouraged me to apply for a job at Haser Engineering Company. So I moved to Chicago and got involved in the hydraulics section there, mainly looking at spillway analysis, reservoir routing, working on large projects in South America, mainly on Guri Dam. And uh, near the end of that time, I started doing a lot on water hammer analysis. And I had seen Ben Wiley give some lectures at a short course at Colorado State, and I was very impressed with uh, his style of teaching. So I wrote to him, and I then went to Michigan, and that really changed my, my, my uh, uh, role from thinking about water resources and hydrology into um, into water distribution system analysis and in particular um, um, transient analysis. So I, I was lucky enough to work with Vic Streeter okay. and uh, he, he was really a person that um, co-supervised my PhD even though he was retired and he recently passed away. He was 103. Uh, and, and he uh, he he had a big significant he had a significant influence on on my career. After I finished um, my degree at Michigan, I moved back to Australia to take on an academic position at the University of Adelaide, and I I, I really continued my water hammer and research, in particular looking at column separation, which I had done my PhD in. But I had been to uh, the nineteen eighty five. Battle of the Networks okay. presentations in Buffalo right. and uh, a number of graduate students from Michigan we drove over to the conference and and at that time I, I thought well I was I, I became quite fascinated with optimization not that I had had any, any formal training and as part of um, my uh, academic beginning of my academic career I would supervise and I still do supervise fourth year projects. So I started looking at supervising fourth year projects in transient analysis, but also in optimization. We tried doing optimization of pipe networks 
using traditional methods, but we didn't we didn't have a lot of success. Okay. And I had done my um, graduate work with Dave Goldberg. He was okay. at Michigan at the same time, and he was actually co-supervised by Ben Wiley and John Holland. And uh, Dave had worked with Stoner and Associates right. um, out in Pennsylvania, and um, so when Dave wrote his book, he sent me a copy. And so, uh, so it was really Dave Goldberg that got me interested in genetic algorithms. And um, having had supervised two projects where we hadn't had much success in optimization, I, I said to a project group in 1990, look, here's Goldberg's book. He's applied it to the op optimizing the operation of gas compressors. Right. I said, I'm sure we can apply it to water, water distribution system um, optimization. And uh, one of the things we first struggled with was how to code the strings. And uh, Dave's problem was the compressors being on and off, okay. so zero or one. And so for the longest time, we, we wondered, well, how do you how do you code multiple pipes? And then it finally dawned, and in retrospect, it seems such a simple thing, but it's finally dawned on us, well, we just have strings with more than one, one zero and one, and uh, so that you could have four choices or eight choices. And, and, and it just seemed, it was hard at the time to figure that out, but it, it seemed so obvious in retrospect. And, and, and I, I guess that's where, that, that's where my uh, interest in, certainly in the optimization part came from. Although I, I guess I've run three separate areas in in my career the first one being um, transient analysis which led into pipe condition assessment which i'll talk a little bit about later on and the optimization which we've talked about but also steady state analysis okay. i've been particularly interested in steady state analysis as well okay uh, that's that's fascinating uh, i did not know that so I, I suspect you were probably one of the first people that really were applying gaz yes of yes um, and and it was really through my links with goldberg i yeah. guess that, it, that, that prompted me to start. So we ended up having, you know, a couple of the first publications in the, in the area of uh, application of genetic algorithm optimization to the design problem. Right. Mm -hmm. So did, did you, I have to ask this question, uh, is that curiosity? So did you basically handle the constraints with penalty methods? Yes, we did. Okay. We, we did. We, we basically would, would simulate, would, for a string, we would decode the string of options we would then calculate the, the real physical cost based on construction cost and purchase of the, the pipes. And then we would simulate it. And we were using just a Hardy Cross simulator uh, okay. initially. And uh, then if it failed to meet the um, pressure constraints, we would penalize it in proportion to the amount by which it had failed. Okay. And then that would then drive. And initially we were using uh, biased roulette wheel selection, which was the, 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 the popular way of uh, doing selection at that time. So right. it was a fairly, it was certainly a fairly basic GA okay. at that time. All right, that's really interesting. Uh, well, you've obviously done a lot of work in trans analysis with regard to leak detection. Yeah. Uh, how did you get, how, what kind of triggered you to kind of start yeah. looking at trans analysis as a way to kind of identify leaks? Yeah. How did that work involve? Or, well, or that, that also came through the influence of a, a dear colleague, and that, that person was Jim Liggett from Cornell. Okay. And um, he had been to the University of Adelaide prior to me going there in 1987 a few times. So he had links with, uh, with the University of Adelaide. He came to Australia um, in the early 90s and he had been uh, doing um, some work um, at Cornell on inverse transient methods, in particular steady state methods, which he found weren't very successful. And then he did some work with Chen um, a PhD student of his where he produced, they produced a paper in 1994 which was a classic paper on the application of inverse transient analysis. He was looking for laboratories to do verification and he kept asking me, 
can you recommend laboratories? And I said, well, you can, you know, there's laboratories at Michigan and there's laboratories in Spain. And I guess after he'd asked me about half a dozen times, I'd, I thought, well, maybe I should do some, uh, some work uh, with Jim and we should do some verification at Adelaide. So he's really how I got started. And um, we wrote a number of uh, proposals and got funding from the Australian government. And I, I guess the first phase of our research was carried out by a PhD student, John Vitovsky. And one of the issues was the matching of the transient traces that we were measuring in the laboratory with the models. And the decay, because of unsteady friction, was not, the match was fairly poor. Uh -huh. So we spent a lot of time developing better unsteady friction models. Okay. So once we got to that point, we set up a fairly extensive laboratory program in the, in the late 90s. And then about 2003, we started very extensive field, field work. And John Vitovsky's um, thesis uh, won the Minnesota Award for the best thesis in 2000. And I've had a number of other PhD students and postdocs working in that area in that time. So it was really Jim Liggett that got me, okay. got me interested uh, in, in that area. Yeah, you mentioned uh, uh, experimental analysis and a laboratory yeah. and field analysis. Uh, how important have you found uh, those types of experiences relative to kind of informing your numerical type yeah. of analysis? Uh, uh, I found it to be extremely important. I guess the, the, my first experience in lab work was setting up a, a one inch pipeline at the University of Michigan for column separation experiments. And once I moved to Adelaide, we set up a similar apparatus, again for column separation experiments. And it was two controlled tanks at either end that we could control the, uh, with a sloping pipeline, so you could actually have flow in either direction. But the having that apparatus enabled me to fairly quickly move to modifying the apparatus to be able to simulate leaks or sections with different properties or parameters. So the, um, I guess experimental work in both the lab and the field is difficult, mm -hmm. but it's, I think it's really essential in order to verify the mathematical models that you're, uh, that you're working with. Okay. Uh, along those same lines, um just kind of maybe speaking to some of the younger researchers in the community, there, are there some general lessons, sort of broad lessons you've learned from those kind of experiences that, that you could identify to pass on? Maybe, yeah, I, I think the, um, the, the lessons really are that you really need to integrate numerical work, experimental work, and field work in the, la in the field if you're going to develop techniques that are going to be practical. Because as soon as you start looking at issues in the laboratory or in the field, there are just so many issues that you have to um, deal with um, that really do feed good information into the numerical model development. So I, th I think that's, uh, that, 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 that combination is essential, I think. Uh, I know you've had a number of international collaborations for your research that have been to be to be very successful. Can you maybe describe a couple of those? Yeah, yeah I, th I think um, the collaboration with Jim Liggett is probably one of my most successful collaborations. And um, I guess having colleagues at your own university that you collaborate well with is good. Uh, and I saw that especially with Vic Streeter and um, Ben Wiley. I mean, they had a fan fantastic even though it was supervisor student, it evolved into a fantastic relationship. And uh, I guess I've been very lucky um, in developing good relationships with Graham Dandy and Holger Meyer and Martin Lambert, and in particular Martin Lambert. We've done a lot of work in the in the inverse transient and condition assessment analysis. And I've also done a lot of work with a computer scientist who's a mathematician, Sylvan Elhay, in the area of network analysis. And, uh, uh, but in terms of uh, Jim Liggett, I mentioned earlier, was important. But I also do, I, 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 uh, I found that the water distribution system analysis conferences have been just fantastic to develop 
friendships and to find people that have similar interests and uh, in, in, at the Alaska conference, I think it was in uh, 2005, I, I met um, a guy from Germany, Jochen Gerlein, and we've worked closely um, ever since that time and Olivia Pillay from Bordeaux came, I've, I've met him over a number of years, but in, in 2012 he came to, to Adelaide and we had a num for the WDSA and we had a number of discussions um, at that time and uh, we now Skype every week and uh, it, it, uh, it's just, I guess I've had a number of other collaborations where you try things out but they aren't successful. But I think that's inevitable. You can't work with everybody. Right. You can't necessarily click with everybody. And you've really just got to keep trying because um, I, I think, th and it's very, I find it very exciting when you're working with colleagues because you tend to have different ideas. And usually the sum of the ideas of two people adds up to five or 10 rather than four right. or two. So, right. and, and, and that's really beneficial, I think. Okay, great. Uh, you, you'd mentioned a little bit about uh, steady state analysis. And I'm just curious, uh, I know you've been publishing some in that area and in particular smart partitioning and new formulations. Uh, I think you've got a paper uh, at this conference, maybe looking at maybe one of those. Uh, could you describe a little bit of that work? Yeah, yeah that, that really started by my collaboration with, with Sylvan Alhay. And he is a numerical analyst. And um, one of the things he does say, he, he always says he knows nothing about engineering or units. And, and um, uh, I say, well, my, my mathematics is certainly not as extensive as his. But it, the, the combination of having um, a good engineer and a good numerical al analysis person has been excellent. So he really got me started. In, or in, in starting to take a look at these issues. The first issue we, we looked at is we started looking at the at Tadini and Pilates global right. gradient algorithm, which he presented, right. I think at a conference in Kentucky in 1987, I think it was. I think that was the, uh, the genesis of it. And um, one of the issues with that particular method is that it doesn't handle zero flows very well, because right. when you invert what's called the G matrix, then you can, if, uh, if you have a zero flow, then you, you get an infinite value. And so um, Sylvan and I developed uh, a regularization method to control the condition number for the solution technique, which was, which quite, which, which was quite successful. And I guess having worked with Jochen Gerlein from Germany, he developed in his PhD some interesting partitioning techniques for networks. And um, I guess one of the papers that Sylvan and I published in 2011 was what was called forest core partitioning to try to divide the network up into the linear part mm -hmm. and the nonlinear part, which actually saves quite um, it, it, a considerable amount of time in, in, in execution. And uh, one of the things that we all learn when we are undergraduate students, of course, is the Hardy Cross method. Right. And that, that technique uh, was developed in 1936 at the University of Illinois. And um, it is a sequential loop by loop algorithm. And uh, then Eppen Fowler developed a simultaneous loop correction technique in, in, in 1970. And uh, so our, mo our more recent work has been looking, going back and revisiting that. And uh, there's um, a paper by uh, an author called Rahal, who published a paper in 1995 on what was, what's called the co-tree method, which is very similar to the simultaneous loop method by Eppen Fowler. But it's complicated. You have to actually put in pseudo links to all of the nodes back to a ground node. Okay. And um, so uh, the most recent paper that I've had with Sylvan is looking at what's called the reformulated co-trees method, which is a method that has a lot of similarities to the global gradient algorithm in that you don't have to define loops. You don't have to use pseudo links. All you need is the information, the connectivity information of pipes and links. And it does lead to, in some cases, a faster algorithm 
than the global gradient algorithm. So it's, it's, it's possible, I think, to come back and revisit these things and in certain circumstances maybe use the global gradient algorithm and in other circumstances use the, the reformulated co-trees method. So it, it's, uh, I've, I've found learning about the mathematics of these things has been uh, fascinating and it's really been a fair focus uh, over the last six or seven years of my career. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, what about teaching? It's, it's, you know, it seems like teaching in the area of water resources is an important interest uh, uh, and it's been very important as part of your, your career. I'm just wondering if you could ex kind of maybe share some of your experiences yeah. in trying to take research in the classroom and how that's been. Yeah, yeah I, I really, I, I think one of the reasons I'm in academia, even though I, I've, I've liked research and, and have had some success in that, but it is the teaching. I mean, I, uh, I love teaching um, second year fluid mechanics and, and third year pumps and EPA net and also I've got a, a water distribution systems course where I teach about the formulation of the network equations, genetic algorithms and water hammer and I, I guess um, I've got an unusual style of teaching and uh, it's, it's not I really can't claim that it's my own. It's, it's, it's really the model that I based it on was a professor at Colorado State who was my supervisor in my master's program, a guy called Professor Hubert morel Setu, um, who did a lot of research in the groundwater area. And he always had a, um, a review of the lecture as the first 10 minutes of every lecture. And I've, I've based my lecturing style on this and I guess I extended it somewhat in that I would learn the names of the students by identifying five different students at the beginning of the lecture and then for the first 10 minutes asking them and only them questions about what we did in the last lecture okay. and it actually forced me to learn their names and okay. so I was I, I would walk around campus and I would I would know the names of many of the students and and I, I think that's a, a very enjoyable thing and also I, I, I've what I've tried to, what I try to do in class is engage and if you ask the students questions and get them to the point where they feel comfortable asking you questions right. which happens fairly quickly then I think it's a really nice environment in the classroom and and having the blend of Teaching fundamentals, I mean, one of the things that really I, I, I enjoy teaching the most is, and it's not related to water distributions funnily enough, is, is the specific energy diagram in open channel flow okay. and the hydraulic jump. And, right. and uh, so it's, it's just wonderful seeing students with the light bulb going on, understanding the material. But in, um, in addition to the, uh, the basic principles, it's nice to talk about the research and to talk about well where you know where's this stuff being applied and 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 how how does it link to the research so right. i think i think the two are so linked and uh, i think uh, often university professors are criticized for well you're only interested in research and you're not interested in in teaching but i think good teaching and getting our young engineers excited about the the field of hydraulics and fluid mechanics and water distributions is an essential role um, for, for, for academicians. Okay, great. Uh, I know two of your research areas have, have resulted in commercialization and transfer of your uh, research to industry. Could you maybe describe that experience a little bit? Yeah, it, I guess it was never a goal to commercialize. It, it kind of happened uh, by accident almost. In, um, once we had started doing the work in uh, optimization in the early 90s. One of our PhD students was looking for a job and he, he suggested, well, what about starting to look at uh, trying to use this commercially? And that really led to the formation of a company called Optimatics. Mm -hmm. And um, that company has grown and uh, is now headquartered in the US and uh, is selling software. And I guess also, um, an indirect commercialization was uh, a number of students who graduated. Uh, Zeng Wu is one of them who works for Bentley right. and also he worked for um, Paul Burlos's company uh, MWH initially and um, so the, that has led to some 
introduction into um, the water industry of some of, some of these techniques. Um, um, so that was that, that was the first uh, commercialization. The second one really, um, uh, and that just going back to that commercialization briefly, um, that the university at the time really didn't want to form a company themselves. They were happy for the inventors to form a company. And uh, so I was involved in partly in running the company for a while, although we quickly had to get competent staff in and um, I do very little I involved with the company now except uh, t take an interest in what they're doing. Right. Uh, but uh, because really my focus has been the teaching and the research, which I, I really prefer. But in terms of the, uh, the pipe condition assessment methodologies, that's now been licensed in Australia and is being picked up by industry. And that was the, the university took a different path. They found a commercial partner to take and license it. And then that, that, that's, that's, it's been satisfying to see some of our results moved from academia into the profession and to actually be a service to, to industry. But I, I guess, as I said before, it was, it was never my goal. It, it almost happened by accident, I guess. Right. Uh, Angus, have you, have you made contributions to uh, the profession by getting involved in professional organizations? How, what's been your experience like with ASE or other organizations? Yeah. How has that kind of impacted yeah. your research? Yeah. And so on? I've been fairly active in the water distribution systems conference series. So I've, I've had some involvement uh, in terms of taking on roles within uh, that organisation. But I, I guess because ASC is not really active in Australia, right. the main, uh, my main professional contribution has been with an Australian organisation called the Australian Water Association. Okay. And um, so I was, I've been, I was heavily involved in the local state committee for a long time. I served on the national board for about five years of the organisation nationally. And um, so um, in, in a similar way to AWWA here and also ASC, one of the objectives is really to run meetings and run conferences to for water professionals uh, in Australia. So I, I gave a lot of my time um, to that organisation. And, and, and I, I found as with WDSA that in terms of meeting people and being associated with uh, others in the industry it's a great it's been a fa it was a fantastic way um, to, to have a, an involvement that wasn't the same as being in the university but was able enabled me to interact with professionals uh, who are who, who were actively working in the water industry and also to see what kinds of problems they're facing because of that, that if you can take those problems back into uh, into your research environment then you can um, at least be addressing practical problems and I guess that's really been the the push in my research is to really try to be focused not on necessarily trying to solve the problems of industry today because I think one of the things with industry is that they they don't really know what they need. They think they know what the, their current researchers' interests are. Right. But I think as academics, we've got to be looking at the new areas. And, and um, uh, I think uh, I remember when I first started thinking about applying genetic algorithms, we went along to the, uh, the local water authority and they, they really weren't interested. Right. And if, if we had said, OK, well, it's not of interest to industry, we might as well not do it. Right. then uh, then uh, it would have been a shame. So I, I think it's our role to not only look at problems that are facing industry now, but also to be the blue sky visionaries to say, well, what are the problems or what are the areas that we should be developing that are going to be important in the next 20 or 30 years? Okay. Uh, well, looking, looking back over your career thus far, uh, what, what would you maybe highlight you think are been some of the most significant contributions that you've made to the to the field and the community? Yeah. Probably the um, introduction of genetic algorithm optimization has okay. been probably, 
I think my my uh, my, my biggest contribution. Although some some of the work in terms of condition as non-invasive condition assessment of pipes has been uh, has also been been significant but they've probably been the two most satisfying and most significant contributions okay uh, could you elaborate a little more on the, the latter on the on the, the, the uh, conditioning the condition assessment yeah of yeah well, I, I guess the the way that uh, the way that works and the the technique that we developed is that we set up a small water hammer event in a pipe system, usually by going to a scour and setting up a side discharge valve. Usually, that side discharge valve is a a, a ball valve, okay. and depending on the size of the pipe that you're investigating, whether it's a 100 mil or a 600 millimeter pipe, um, the size of the orifice or the nozzle varies between 15 millimeters and up to 75 millimeters. So what you do is you open up the, the valve so that it, it's discharging. You have a, a, a torsional spring which then closes the valve rapidly in, in a matter of four to 10 milliseconds, produces a pressure rise in the pipe of between two to five or seven meters. That then propagates along the pipeline system. We then set up high speed pressure transducers to measure at 10,000 samples a second, which has a GPS unit that takes a, a, a timestamp every second, which is accurate to uh, 90 nanoseconds. And then from the analysis of those pressure traces, then you infer the condition in the pipeline system. So we've developed about six or seven mathematical methods uh, which involve time shifting, um, analysis of the standard deviation of the signal, um, and uh, f frequency domain analysis in order to f firstly detect leaks. So I guess our main focus when we started with Jim Liggett was the, the, dr the dream of detecting leaks um, of any size, but we found it actually, once we moved into the field, it, leak detection worked incredibly well theoretically. But as soon as we moved into uh, the field, we had to have a very, very large leak to be able to <laughs> detect, especially if there was a lot of noise coming from the uh, the t deterioration of the pipe. So we, um, after about four or five years, we really moved the research into condition assessment okay. and really determining um, different the, the different wave speeds in the pipes and whether there are blockages. And that's been a lot more successful in terms of the, the, the application. I, I still think leak detection is a tough problem, yeah. especially, spin, you know, they say, well, can you detect a pinhole leak? And my answer is, well, our techniques certainly can't do that. Right. But certainly if you want to get an idea of the, uh, whether there's been severe cement mortar spalling in the pipe okay. or whether there's been uh, a reduction in the steel thickness of the pipe, then the techniques seem to be much better suited to that than the the problem of leak detection. Okay, could that theoretically be used for prediction of uh, uh, future breaks potentially? Or it's. Not? I think it could be, but it, it would have to be linked to kind of a breakage model okay. based on the thickness of the pipe. So I think you'd need to probably work with ma uh, materials people. Right. So I think I, I think there could be some links. We haven't developed those links yet. At the moment, it's really using our methodology to say, well, this portion has reduced from a pipe wall thickness of five millimetres down to three and a half millimetres. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, along the same lines, what are kind of some future areas of research that you'll think be important in the field if you're talking to uh, some PhD student and like, hey, and he said, uh, you know, Dr. Simpson, what what area should I be focusing on for yeah. my research yeah. the next, you know, twenty years or yeah. so? Well, yeah. What advice might you give that person? Yeah, I th I think there are there there are two areas that come to mind that um uh, and some work has started in these areas already. I think one of them is real time operations, and I okay. think I think the um the things that are going to make a huge difference are the availability of sensors, high-speed sensors and numerous sensors. One of the real problems, especially in trying to calibrate pipe networks, is the lack of measurement in the system. Often you'll only have two or three 
flow measurements and maybe half a dozen pressure measurements and then you're trying to calibrate the pipe roughnesses or demands in a network and you're trying to predict hundreds of them. But as we, uh, there's um, moves in places like Singapore where they're putting in 2,000 high speed uh, sensor uh, sensors over their entire network. So I, I, I think that's got real potential. A lot of work's going on in Europe in terms of uh, real-time control and calibration of networks. So I think that's probably uh, an exciting area. There's, I think there's still a lot to do in the area of pipe condition assessment. Mm -hmm. We're doing some work with some people now and and part of this, I think part of the, excited, the, the potential exciting work is that at the moment we're often quite restricted in where we measure the variation of pressure. You have to go to a place where you can place a pressure transducer, which will often be a, an air valve or a, a location in the network in, a, in the pipeline. And often then they're not where you would like them to be. Right. And um, so some of the work that um, we're starting to look at now is uh, using inserted fiber optics that might have pressure measurement locations in the fiber optic table at every five or ten meters or every meter for example so okay. you might run it along um, a, a kilometer of pipe right. and have potentially a hundred places where you measure the pressure variation so I think there's I think there's I think we're at the infancy of the condition assessment I think there's going to uh, potentially be um, a lot a lot more research that uh, that can be done in in that area okay do you think uh, there might be this this concept of sort of smart pipes where you build sensors into the actual yes pipes I, th I think I think so and um, especially I think that's got a lot of potential in uh, things like plastic pipes uh -huh. and, and, and GRP pipes that these these could be built into I, into the into the walls of the pipes right. for monitoring over long periods of time. Right. Yes. Yeah, right. so. Okay. Um, well, I mean, you've obviously been one of the pioneers in the Australian research community in water distribution uh, analysis. Just wondered if you, if you have uh, a, a few perspectives or, or comments you can give us that kind of uh, gives those, you know, particular maybe in the U.S. that may not be quite as familiar, uh, kind of highlight some of the contributions that you've seen over the years. Yeah. Well, I, I guess um, one of the things I experienced when in studying in the U.S., was the almost the decline of hydraulics especially in the in the 80s it seemed like there wasn't money right in terms going into research in in the area in the traditional areas of, right. of hydraulics and water hammer there was a lot of movement to go into waste contamination and groundwater cleanup and groundwater modeling so a lot of money and research went into that area i, I guess um post um, um you know the uh, the attacks in New York City 9/11 yeah. um, led to a lot of research, especially in security right. of, of pipe networks. So that really um, that really uh, picked things up. But but I guess in Australia, one of the things that I see is that there are very few academics in the area of, of um, hydraulics and, and, and the, the traditional areas. There are, there are some graduates that have come through our system, but if you look at virtually every other university in Australia, the University of Adelaide is the only university that has active research uh, in the area of uh, um, uh, water distribution systems or the traditional types of hydraulics. Most of the others are involved in things like hydrology okay. and, and, and groundwater. There's, I guess, a lot of hydro, hydrologic research that goes on in, this, in Australia. So, uh, so I, I guess the, um, uh, the attitude I, I guess I've had to take is to collaborate with people overseas. I guess overall the, the WDSA community is relatively small. Right. And um, I, I think uh, the probably the most important thing is good international collaboration and things like WDSA uh, enable those contacts to be made and those the friendships to be developed, okay. which will which can lead to um, continuing that, that those that that research. All right, well, great. Thanks you for those uh, those great perspectives. Thank you.